So the only reason why I chose that song is because it had the word stoic in it, but it, it wasn't indicative of any stoic philosophy. Um, so welcome to the Stoa, everyone. Um, today we have Matthew Sharp with us. Uh, Matthew is a philosopher, um, I believe uh, at the university is called Deakin University. Um, and he wrote uh, a really excellent paper called Stoic Virtue Ethics, and he's, he's written about uh, Stoicism um, in his academic uh, research and studies. Uh, Matthew and I kind of run in the same Stoic circles. Uh, we were in Athens uh, at the last kind of Stoic International Conference. He's been on Massimo Piglucci's podcast. Um, and for people who are aware of the Stoa, for whatever reason, like 99% of the events are not about stoicism, it's about something else. So I thought maybe we should change that. We should actually have an stoic event. We had like everyone from Noam Chomsky to uh, ContraPoints, we had actually no that much stoics. Uh, and I'm sort of like a, a practicing stoic. So I thought this would be good to start with a session on stoic virtue ethics. Um, and uh, so how today's gonna work, I'm gonna tag in Matthew in a moment. And he's going to share his screen. He's going to have about a 20 minute uh, presentation, slide presentation on uh, Stoic virtue ethics. And if you have any questions during the presentation, just put them in the chat. Uh, I'll call on you, unmute yourself, ask your question to, to Matthew, and then we'll have a um, QA and probably for about an hour total. Um, and if you don't want to be on YouTube, just indicate that and I will read your question on your behalf. So, that being said, I will take Matthew in. Welcome. To the stoa, my friend. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'm just going to now share my screen. Um, so hopefully, hopefully this goes well. Let's see. Let's see. <clears throat> there it is. Are people seeing slides? It looks like there's a slight delay. Uh, yeah. Now it's now it's okay. there. Now we need to just get the slideshow going. Okay. Yeah, so it's fully up. Okay, well, thank you so much, Peter, and thank you everybody for attending. Um, so Peter's asked me to talk about a paper I wrote in 2013, which um, was on stoic virtue ethics. It was for a, a collection. Um, on virtue ethics. And so what I thought I'd do is rather than just kind of read the paper, which would also probably take up the full hour, I would just um, give a, a short presentation of some of the hits, I guess, some of the key ideas that um, struck me as I reread the paper in preparation for today's class, which can also, or today's session, excuse me, I've been teaching all, all week. Um, and um, yeah, just, just uh, raise some of what I consider to be the key points that we can then um, pursue. Um, so I, I'm not familiar with the audience, many of the audience beyond Peter. So I'm not sure what your familiarity is with virtue ethics. So it struck me that the first thing I should probably do is, is just give you um, just a little bit of an indication of, of what this kind of this term means within the academic setting um, before I proceed in, into, sto in, into Stoicism specifically. So virtue ethics has become uh, an approach within modern moral philosophy, um, within the academic space, probably over the last 25 to 30 years. And it's responding to um, perceived uh, and real, arguably, limitations in the two predominant modern approaches to uh, moral philosophy. So moral philosophy asks concerning what it is that makes an action right or good. Um, and the approaches of Kantianism and utilitarianism take pretty much rule-based approaches. Both of them present competing universal rules, um, which um, are supposed to give us what are called necessary and sufficient conditions for an action being considered good or right. Now, as an approach to thinking through issues around evaluation and, and how to live and how to act well, uh, people like Elizabeth Anscombe and then subsequently others have pointed out that the approach is quite limited. It doesn't tell you, for example, much about how you become a good person and, and the relationship between good action and, and a good life. Uh, and so in this context, modern philosophers have begun to, to turn towards um, ancient approaches, preeminently um, Aristotelian approaches to, to reframe modern ethical inquiry 
and to try to generate alternative understandings of what makes an action right or good. Now, in classical Greece and Rome, um, and this is not often recognised in the literature where Aristotle is, is really um, absolutely predominant uh, for reasons we might discuss. Um, classical Greek, Greece and Rome, as far as I can see, all of the ancient ethicists, um, the ancient ethical philosophers were what we would call virtue ethicists. That is, they focused on, on this concept of, 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 of virtue that is um, the character trait or traits, uh, virtues in the plural, that might make a person able to live a good life. And there are different disputes about what, what are the virtues, where they come from, how many are there, and whether they're in fact enough to make a person happy or whether you need extra things. Um, but all of the ancient philosophical schools and Stoicism preeminent amongst them, believe that strengths of character, as you'll be familiar, um, uh, the, these virtues, which I'm just going to call strengths of character, um, are vital for living well and acting well. And in this space, um, the Stoics are what you could call maximalists because their position is much stronger than Aristotle's, for example. Aristotle thinks that you do need other things in order to live well, as well as just the virtues. Um, but the Stoics typically are maximalists. That is, they believe that virtue is the only good. And and so I set out in the paper, and I want to set out now again to explore uh, what, what this all means um, and probably just to try and along the way differentiate the Stoic position from, from several others. Um, I'm aware that you can't see me before I kind of move into Stoicism. So I'm just wanting to um, just see if I can, can, can I change, I can change that, can't I, Peter? If I put start video on, people can at least see my, see my face is yep. in the corner of their screens. Yeah. I just feel, I mean, we're, we're already um, mediated. Um, so let's try and remove at least one of the mediations. Um, okay. So let's um, start off by looking at the goal of life for the Stoics. And I've really got eight, eight kind of key, eight or nine key slides that I'm just going to talk you through. And as I say, these can become our talking points and hopefully they'll be clarificatory too. And one of the things that I want to do along the way, and what, one of the things I was trying to do in the paper was really just emphasise how, how coherent the Stoic position is. That is how internally consistent the different aspects of the philosophy are. And this is something that was noticed in antiquity and I think is, is evidently a strength of the philosophy. And I think being able to kind of look at the different aspects of the philosophy and how they fit together is, is itself quite powerful. So the Stoics are eudaimonists. People will probably be familiar with this term. Um, it means that they were interested in, in how we could live a fulfilled life. This, this word is sometimes translated as, as happiness, which I think is a little bit, as you probably heard, a little bit, um, a little bit short of the mark. There are other Greek, ancient Greek terms for happiness for a start. Um, but eudaimonia specifically, I think, carries the connotation of living a fulfilled life, that is, um, a life in which one's potentials are fulfilled. And the Stoics add to this a very famous definition that you can see if you go to, to modern-day Larnaca and you look at the, the statue of, of Zeno there, you'll see underneath the, um, the single phrase that is underneath that statue, which is to live in harmony with nature. And so the Stoics have a position that to fulfill oneself is to live in harmony with nature. And obviously this means, first of all, your nature as a human being. And for the Stoics, again, as for many of the ancient philosophical schools, almost all of them, we're defined by our capacity for uh, what we can call rationality. Again, translation is a little bit of an issue here. Um, what is intended is, is that we're, we're in, um, animals and we are animals, we're part of the cosmos, um, we're natural creatures, but we're natural creatures who have language and who can reflect upon our actions and imp impulses. Uh, we can communicate and reason about the motives for our actions. And we're also deeply social. That is where we're born into families and um, this social dimension of who we are, our connectedness to others is, is absolutely basic. It's not sort of optional if you like. Uh, of course, we can, we can do different things with it, but it, it, it's, it's where we begin. Uh, the other way that, that Zeno famously describes the goal of life, as you probably will be familiar, which again is, is quite different from what you'll find in other schools, is that the aim should be to live a good flow of life. And this is a, obviously a river metaphor. 
and it's a metaphor of, of water um, streaming um, down towards the sea, I guess, and encountering obstacles, going around corners and so on and so forth, but in each case adapting smoothly um, and, and continuing on, on the course. So I think this description of life really connotes what you'll see in many of the texts, of course, which is the Stoics are also interested in, in um, the value and importance of tranquility, serenity, um, the Greek word apatheia, not having damaging passions. Constantia is, is one of the, the, the Latin words um, to be constant. And again, you, you just won't find these values as primarily in Aristotle. Um, Plato is a little bit more complex, I think, on this, but certainly in Aristotle, um, tranquility, serenity and the like are just not things that he will really tell you a lot about. Um, so Epictetus tells us that to, to be happy, to be fulfilled is to be in a state in which we experience no unsatisfied desire. And of course, the figure who might embody this is, is the sage who will also be the bearer of all the virtues. Okay, so the issue with any position that I think aims at happiness um, from a virtue ethics perspective might be to say, well, why do we need the virtues? Why don't we just kind of go straight for happiness? Why don't we just go straight for tranquility? And if, you know, we could plug ourselves into a, a tranquility machine, why shouldn't we just do that? And I think the Epicureans have a harder job to, to kind of forestall that criticism, but I don't think the Stoics have much problem with it at all because their idea is that you're not going to get to these goals without cultivating the virtues. The virtues make up what it is to, to live a fulfilled life. Um, so the idea that virtue is the only good is, is really kind of a defining idea and a really central idea in, in Stoicism, I think, and, and also practically really powerful, um, I've found anyway, in terms of just keeping your head together in adversity. So good on this model is anything which benefits somebody. Um, and so something would be truly good only if and only if it, it always and only benefits um, the individual or, or being in question. And the Stoics argue that virtue is, is the only thing in the universe that will always and only benefit you. Um, we can be deprived of other things, um, the so-called external goods like money, uh, fame and power and the like, and still be happy. Uh, and we can observe people um, who are poor but happy. <clears throat> and there's a lot of sociological research to suggest that, um, that, that, that happiness levels in different uh, income stratas are a lot more um, constant within certain limits than you might imagine. Um, <clears throat> every other thing, again, these external goods can sometimes harm or even ruin you. Um, and what this means for the Stoics is that uh, it's not, these other things like say, let's just use the example of money, I guess. Um, money is neither good nor evil in itself. It's kind of what you do with it. Um, it's only made good on the basis of the attitude and intelligence um, that you bring to, to using it. Uh, if you, you know, for example, use it to cultivate bad habits, um, destructive habits, um, you know, move away from all your friends and sort of become arrogant and, and all the rest of it, uh, of course, it can actually um, uh, occasion harm. So <clears throat> what it is that even makes these other things good is, is not something out there in the world, but something internal. Um, and the Stoics identify this something internal, this kind of knowledge about this know-how about how to handle things, as we'll see, um, with, with virtue. Virtue is a form of knowledge. It's, it's not simply a form of knowledge, um, but it is, it's a form of knowledge about how to respond to the things which provoke desire and aversion. And you'll see that opposition of desire and aversion in Epictetus really front and center from the start of the, the manual and so on. Um, and, and having such a, a know-how about how to navigate um, around the world, if you like, or with the things of the world and with others uh, will never harm you. Um, and it will also enable you to, to never be harmed by either good or bad fortune, that is prosperity or adversity. And of course we need to add ideally, since the sage is as rare as the phoenix in Egypt. So, I think Stoicism is often misrepresented about non-engagement um, or withdrawal, you know, this idea that it's all about kind of inner strength and making yourself into a fortress or an island against adversity. Um, and it's somehow a defensive philosophy. It's not life embracing. 
And I, I think that this is, is misleading. I think as much as Aristotelianism or any of the other Greek philosophies, um, the Stoics are very much this worldly. I mean, ontologically they were, but I also think ethically. Um, it's not as though we can stop dealing with external things just because we don't think that they're either good or evil. Uh, it's rather that we want to cultivate a new, a new attitude towards them, a knowledge of how to use and enjoy them. Um, and this in particular is, is um, explored in the language of, uh, of what to select and what to reject. Um, and it's not as though the Stoics are like the ancient cynics or the medieval monks. It's not that we should reject fame, we should reject money, we should reject health always um, and in all circumstances. These things are, are according to nature and having them is preferable. Um, and likewise, uh, poverty, ill health and powerlessness are not usually to be selected. They're not to be cultivated uh, as Stoics. The cynics disagree. Um, they, they have a stronger position, um, uh, you know, kind of identified or identifiable with someone like Diogenes who lived in a barrel and really just kind of dropped out, as we'd say. Um, the thing about it is that these things have um, selective value and disvalue uh, and the Stoics will use a different word for value as against goodness. They'll talk about axia um, rather than, um, I guess, agathon or agatha in the plural. Um, so they're to be preferred or dispreferred. So it means that in some circumstances, and we'll see how this, this carries through, um, you'll, you'll be familiar with the reservation clause. It may not be best to select um, money. It may not be best to select fame. Um, it may be best um, to, to select poverty in some circumstances. It, it does depend on what situation you find yourself in. But clearly what's going on in distinguishing between what is preferred and what is good is you should never choose or avoid these things at the price of your character. Um, you shouldn't try to gain the world and lose your own soul thereby, as the Gospel of John might concur. So... I think that Stoic ethics um, has a basis, or at least it's perfectly coordinate and consistent with its larger, with Stoicism's larger natural philosophy. And I think we can really see this when we look at this idea of oikiosis, which someone like Christopher Gill, for example, has written a lot on, um, but there are other sources as well. And oikiosis is an account of, of really how we develop. Um, I guess the best translation would be something like adaptation to the environment. Um, the opposite of it would be being alienated from your environment. Um, and so the argument is that each creature within nature has been equipped by nature to, to kind of fare well within its environment and to develop over time the capacities to navigate itself around the world in its particular place in the cosmos. And humans are no different than that. We begin with a desire for self-preservation um, and therefore it always remains, as we've said, selective for us to, to choose things that are necessary for self-preservation with that reserve clause that we've talked about. Sometimes perhaps it isn't. But the key thing is that in terms of differentiating us from, from you know, what the Stoics would call lower animals, I guess, the non-rational animals, is that around age 14, um, this idea of the age of reason, that human reason can supervene on, begins to be able to supervene on impulse. We become capable of self-control on the basis of stopping and reflecting on possible courses of action, possible motivations and the like. Um, and we're able to do this in particular, if you look at the different accounts, I think in the light of two uh, considerations. Firstly, a sense that as individuals, we belong to a larger order um, of which ourselves and our actions just form one small part. And of course, the view from above exercise in someone like Marcus Aurelius or Seneca will enforce this, this sense. But also um, we're capable of extending our natural sympathy um, with those in our immediate circles who've been part of our self-preservation as children and part of our development as infants and the like. We can begin to um, extend this capacity outwards to others in our communities and then ultimately using the famous Stoic idea of the, the expanding circles outwards to the human community, the cosmos, the cosmopolitanism. Um, actions that then follow reason are, are called kathekonta, uh, actions which befall us, sometimes translated as duties, which I think 
kind of is a little bit a little bit soft I think I mean this idea of actions which befall us um, I think has a, has a nice other set of connotations and when you do these actions for the sake of virtual sins they become actions according to right order excuse me for the double d there <laughs> um cat, cat orthomata um and so you can do right actions but for the wrong reasons um and you'll be fulfilling your catholic content but when you get your motivational set in place which is what the philosophy and what the stoic practice would um, aim for then you'll be performing actions according to right order. So virtue on this model is, as again, as you're probably familiar with um, this metaphor, it's like a, a, an art or techne or craft or sport or skill um, like archery. Now the aim of archery is of course always to hit the mark um, and to therefore win the prize, I guess. Um, but even the most perfect archer, the Stoics point out, can't guarantee, certainly if the competition is outside, that something might not intervene um, from the outside world that might even prevent even the best laid plans from actually achieving the, the aim or the scopos. Um, so what this means is that all that the archer can do, of course, is prepare as best as possible. Uh, that is take ownership of everything that he or she can, what she eats, what she does, how she practices, um, the competitions that she enters into, the, um, the, the competitions previously that might lead up to the big, big competition and so on and so forth. All of that is within their control. Um, and the goal will be to prepare as best as possible. Virtue, of course, aims at achieving the, the, the aim, the scopos. Um, nevertheless, and here again, we this constant refrain, um, you can't unfortunately perhaps well we're not god we're not zeus so we can't control everything um we we need to recognize the limits of our control and what is and is not dependent upon us per epictetus and 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 the other the other texts and here we do get the the idea of the stoic reserve or um hypexiresis um which is basically this idea of you aim to do what is right you aim to to hit the target of course but you also <laughs> allow that fate, providence, nature, chance, however you want to describe it, um, can intervene. Um, and so we're, we're here in the, in the space of, of course, of Epictetus's dichotomy of control, which uh, modern Stoicism, I think, rightly emphasizes as absolutely primary to, to Stoic practice. We can do all we can, but we can't do more. And of course, to preoccupy ourselves with, with trying to change what we can't change is at a certain basic level um, going to prove fruitless. Um, so again, you see, we select the things according to nature, except if certain things might intervene. We aim at the goal of virtue, the scop sorry, the, the, the scopos, again, but provided certain things don't intervene. And so there's this kind of reflective attitude in, in Stoicism of, which isn't a defeatist attitude. It's, I think it, it truly is just a realistic attitude that, um, can try to get that promotion um, but we may not we can try to you know have a fulfilling relationship but to some extent things might intervene that might prevent that and, and, and it, everything that concerns changing the external world is like that um, and stoicism is about recognizing that it's not about not trying i mean there's this idea that stoicism so, so we should all just give up again i just don't think that's an accurate representation of stoicism no you should keep trying there, there are things that uh, we may be able to control and we can we can try and we can certainly influence. Um, it's just that if we, we imagine that we can somehow um, take full control of them, we're deluding ourselves and perhaps others as well. So virtue is a systematic set of beliefs about what to choose and why. This um, is correlative with uh, a consistent state in the mind or the psyche of the virtuous agent. And the Stoics use this language. They say that it involves a certain tenor, a certain, I guess, um, construction um, uh, for the reception of impressions. So a certain inner state, a certain inner um, set of capacities, which is this language of, I guess, a tenor, kind of almost like a tension for the reception of impressions. So why the reception of impressions? Because it's through impressions of the outside world that we, we form judgments about it and impulses towards certain kinds of actions and so if we can um, 
shape the way that we respond to the external world at the level of these impressions and how we interpret them, then, um, then it becomes possible to, to respond differently, to form different ideas, um, to, to assent to different impulses. So it's also a set of dispositions then to respond to events and to form and withhold judgments. So the sage will hold certain beliefs with certainty, as in he will hold beliefs that are, that are certain about things that he knows or she knows with, with certainty, with due conviction um, and will be unwaverable, for example, due to social pressures. So think of Socrates at his trial. He's got every reason. He's got a lot of externals on the line, <laughs> but he, he says, well, if you release me, I'll continue doing philosophy. Why? Because I believe with, with certainty that this is the right thing for me to be doing. The sage will also have dialectical skill. And this is the idea that logic is a virtue um, and dialectical skill involves a carefulness in what ideas you assent to, not assenting with certainty to things that are uncertain. Um, for example, not assenting to impulses that you haven't considered and that may be uh, destructive um, and short term rather than medium and long term. And non precipitancy, which is this idea of um, the capacity to withhold your assent to ideas until sufficient or impulses until sufficient evidence is available. And again, you can see this in something like Seneca on anger. He talks about one strategy for dealing with possible anger is, is making sure that you have your facts straight before you kind of, um, <laughs> you know, flip out. Um, you know, someone tells you that someone else has said something bad about you. Well, find out whether that's true. Um, withhold the, you know, the impulse to get angry, at least until you know for sure. I mean, have you been told this correctly? Um, is somebody else stirring the pot? And so on and so forth. That would be an example, I think, of non-precipitancy. Physics is a virtue for the Stoics, again, and Aristotle clearly is just not going to go into anything like this, this kind of space. Um, Studying physics, Chrysippus, the Stoic tells us, is the best starting point to learn ethics. Cicero's Cato in his book on moral ends tells us that you can't really judge good and, and bad with, with um, full um, capacity without knowing the whole purpose or ratio of nature. So physics, I think, is about understanding our place in the larger whole, um, as it, uh, that is, um, at the age of reason, as we've seen before that time. Um, one might presumably be able to understand things at a theoretical level, but the capacity to then use that to shape your impulses, um, I think, is, is this idea of supervening, reason supervening, just coming in on top of the impulses and perhaps reforming them. Um, and I think you need this idea of, of physics and one sense of belonging um, in the larger order to explain the way that Stoicism in some circumstances, for example, if you're fighting in the army, we'll, we'll argue that the right thing to do is, is an action of self-sacrifice. Um, I, I think unless you have a sense that you belong to some larger order, self-sacrifice can never make sense. And this is the predominant Stoic and Ciceronian criticism of Epicureanism. Epicureanism can't lead you to, to for example, be a good soldier, really, um, or potentially to be a good citizen insofar as being a good citizen might lead you to situations where you need to put others first. Um, in some cases, the Stoics tell us that it can be reasonable for you to sacrifice yourself and, and what can that mean except that reasonable in the light of some larger set of considerations that are not, um, I guess, pinned to your own egoic development. And this is not to say that this is a philosophy, again, of self-sacrifice. It's just to say that other things being equal, most of the time we won't be put into situations where self-sacrifice is, is a rational necessity. But there are situations where things get difficult. Um, and the Stoics, again, this reserve clause, they want us to keep the flexibility and the openness to, to, to be responsive in those situations. So this idea of the view from above, which, which really puts you in the picture as just one really small being within the larger order of time and space, I think is, is a practical way of trying to reinforce this. It reminds you that the external things that um, society can tell us to, to value as kind of imperative to happiness, are transient, and um, in a larger perspective, neither good nor evil, that is indifferent. Um, so this idea of our belonging to the larger whole, I think it is part of Stoic ethics. It's, it's not the whole of Stoic ethics, but you can really see it in these kind of test situations. 
And my final slide just concerns, I guess, um, the importance of, of courage in Stoicism and the way that it reforms classical Greek ideas, um, particularly in Aristotle. Aristotle's idea of courage is probably, you know, here as elsewhere, a pretty commonsensical, or at least it's closer to what we might still consider common sense. You know, we have fear when things that we value are threatened and the courageous agent will respond with a right level of fear. Um, so this fear will be motivating them to act um, and to, to defend what they believe to be to be valuable, um, fear is natural and courage is, and this is where the tension comes in the Aristotelian account, I guess courage is, is kind of mastering fear, but it can't be overcoming it because fear is natural um, on the Aristotelian view. Why is it natural? Because Aristotle thinks that external goods are in fact not indifferent um, and that we need them in order to be happy, at least a modicum of them. Um, the Stoics don't have this problem, I think, with, with sort of you need fear um, but not too much, which is the Aristotelian view. And fear is, of course, terribly difficult to master. It's the kind of emotion that floods us with uh, various um, neurochemicals and so on and so forth, which um, makes it difficult to keep your head. The Stoics argue that true courage can, can overcome fear because it doesn't really feel fear because um, it knows that, in a sense, there's, there's nothing that is truly valuable, that is truly good, that can be taken from... The, the, the stoic agent. Um, externals are considered indifferent, as we said, and their potential loss is therefore, it's not fearful, it's not to be preferred. We shouldn't actively choose it or kind of destroy our stuff just to prove how tough we are. But um, if push comes to shove, then the, the true stoic, as hard as it sounds, will, will be prepared to take a hit in terms of externals in order to not lose virtue. Um, so the only thing the Stoic might fear losing would be virtue, but of course Zeus has not set the game up in that way. That is um, our, our choices, our beliefs, and the things that shape our, our character are within our own control. So here's where you get these kind of specifically Stoic virtues that I, I don't think you, you have any analog um, in the other schools that, I, that I'm familiar with, and perhaps people can contest that. Um, so you get these descriptions of eusychia, um, like having a good psyche, which is the virtue of knowing that the soul is invulnerable. Now, for the Aristotle, the soul is vulnerable so far as happiness is at least to some extent dependent upon externals. So that just doesn't make sense for an Aristotelian. Um, then you get this idea of theraliotes, um, the knowledge that nothing terrible can happen. Again, like to, to, to get that as a conclusion, you, you need to have, I think, stoic premises presumably what is being described. And, and these descriptions come from doxographies. And unfortunately, the more extensive discussions of them that you might wish for don't seem to be available. Um, nothing terrible can happen to the sage because the only thing that might be terrible for him would be to, to become vicious. And the sage knows that that's within their dispositional control. And uh, I'll just finish with this idea of megalopsychia um, and this um, picture of um, the Acropolis at Pergamum really captures this, I think. The sense or the knowledge that, that uh, the sage is above what befalls both good and bad people alike. And again, to get that as a conclusion, as a prospect, I think you need to have stoic perception because what befalls both good and bad people alike is that they come into money, they lose money. They come into fame, they lose fame. They come into power, they lose power. They come into health, they lose health. That happens to good and bad people alike. And th this knowledge of being above, um, like this kind of Acropolis idea is, is, um, is the sense that since these things are indifferent, they're to be preferred and dispreferred, um, the, the sage will be able to navigate no matter what happens. And that gives them this kind of sense of, of serenity. So I don't know whether I've gone too long, Peter. I, I think I might well have done a little more than I thought that I would, but um, I think we've still got a little bit of time on. Um, so thank you very much for listening and, and thanks for your patience. Awesome. Uh, I'm just gonna unshare your screen. Um, yeah, I, I always geek out <laughs> when people talk about Stoic virtue ethics. Um, so if you have any questions, put them in the chat. We've got some uh, great questions um, already. Uh, just a quick question. I'm curious 
what your personal relationship is with Stoicism, because uh, I know you did a, uh, have done a lot of great academic work on it, but do you identify as a Stoic? Do you, uh, would you consider you practice as a Stoic? Like, would, uh, like how, do you, how do you, what's your relationship with it? Thank you for asking that. Yeah, um, I, um, around the time I was writing this paper, I, um, it was before I had two small children, I used to get up and, and do an hour of, of meditation um, every morning, where, which would, would blend, I guess, Eastern techniques with, with I guess, um, you know, trying to deeply internalise Stoic principles. Um, since the kids have come and the sleep has gone, um, I, I haven't been able to maintain that kind of rigour. Um, but what I, what I always say is that I'm, I, I, I'd say that intellectually I'm 80% I'm with the Stoics and um, I, I think there are, there are parts of the Stoic system that um, I'm still not convinced by or I want to have further discussions on, but Stoicism is the one philosophy that I've ever encountered that I am comfortable I'm saying 80% um, with just a little bit of reserve perhaps. Um, it, 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 discovering Stoicism for me, as it, probably for many people around the world, was it felt a little bit like coming home, or in the sense that I just, I just, I hadn't been taught it in my academic career, and I was 15 years in, and I was just like, "Where have you been all my life?" You know. Um, so I, I, I think I, I do identify as a Stoic, and and although I don't do the 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 kind of regular morning meditation in the way that um, I did in the past. I certainly take into account Epictetus's idea that, you know, the key thing about, about Stoicism is trying to monitor your impressions and to try to keep aware of um, what you're thinking and the impulses that you're forming. And that Stoicism, therefore, as it, it, it can and I think ideally should involve these kinds of designated times where one, one practices. Um, it's also something you can do on the road. So I say to my students, I, I do Stoicism on the road. That is, I try to, I try to take Epictetus's idea to heart, you know, which is kind of imagine him looking over your shoulder and next time you want to get angry at your kids, ask yourself, what would Epictetus, uh, what would Epictetus say? Uh, and then go into that dialogue. But I'm really tired. And this is the 10th time they've done this. Yes, but... And imagine Epictetus um, trying to intervene there. Yeah, that that uh, tracks uh, with my experience too. Uh, my academic philosophy uh, career didn't touch Stoicism at all. It's only I learned about it outside of uh, the academy, and it was that 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 is well put. Like it felt like it was a coming home. Um, so we got some great questions. Uh, let's take in Laura. Laura, you got a bunch, so. Feel free to choose which one's most alive. Sure, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Sharp, for coming and joining us. I do have a number of questions, so maybe I'll ask two yeah. and then you can answer which one is more interesting to you, <laughs> um, if that's all right. Um, the first one was just, I had this, um, I just remember that famous passage in Thucydides where he describes the virtues kind of disintegrating and being renamed. So what used to be a vice would now become a virtue. And I just wondered what does it mean to practice virtue ethics in a society that is upholding virtues that aren't actually virtues, you know? And, and what does mm -hmm. living well or flourishing look like in that society? And then the second question was just, um, what are the recommended uh, subjects and ways of studying this ratio of nature? Um, this kind of principle that allows you to determine good from bad. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, um, the, the Corsara passage from Thucydides, which is just an incredible passage um, about the disintegration of, of the virtues, yeah, and the way that things that um, were previously vices were accounted virtues. I mean, it's, it's an incredible passage, um, and thanks for reminding me of it. Um, you know, I, I think that Stoicism is, is one of its strengths is that, you know, this, this idea that um, the, the, the standards of, of, of virtue come from, from nature, as you know, um, in the Stoic view. And what this means is that, you know, in, in situations where, where societies aren't going so well from the perspective of virtue ethics, I think Stoicism allows you that independence. I mean, clearly it becomes more difficult when, when you find yourself in situations where you see bad modes of conduct just being, I guess, sanctioned, sponsored, and even celebrated. Um, you know, it becomes more difficult, but I, I don't think there's anything in that situation that 
should should make a, a stoic balk at, at their stoicism. Um, it's an interesting thing because, I mean, you were, are you probably familiar with Epictetus saying that if you're going to practice stoic philosophy, don't tell anybody, <laughs> almost conceal it. And I think that's to do with humility and sort of, you know, this idea of, whoa, I'm a stoic now. Um, but um, I also think it's, I mean, he, and he says this, you, you'll be laughed at, you know, if people, if you say that you're going to be a stoic and you, you're terribly interested in practicing the virtues, and this is second century Rome, you're going to be laughed at. And, and I do think that that's still a thing. And um, um, I certainly don't, I just don't feel comfortable really talking about this stuff to, to people who aren't Stoics <laughs> for, for that reason. Um, but again, I, as I say, my, my sense of the philosophy and, and people can, can, can chime in is that it just makes it more difficult and it provides more incentives at the level of those externals to, to sort of, to, 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 um, to kind of give up or give in or to, 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 to trade away virtue. But I don't think the Stoic stance would be um, necessarily affected by, by the external situation um, in which we find ourselves uh, in that way. Um, in terms of what, what might allow you to, to understand the ratio of nature, now this is a huge question that people are probably familiar with is being debated within modern Stoicism because a lot of Stoic physics, you know, the idea that there are only four elements, for example, uh, are clearly are not physical propositions that we kind of any longer accept. Um, my position on this is that for the ancient Stoics, I think the study of physics was, as I've indicated, terribly important because it, it sort of, it, it points you towards the, the way in which you're, you're belonging, you, you do belong to a larger order and, 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 you're, and the ego is, is not primary as, as Ryan Halliday has, has, has been, been sort of obviously um, writing about. Um, we, we're given on loan a, a, a proportion, uh, this is the idea, right? You're given intelligence and the capacity to, to craft a life on loan from Zeus or from nature for, for, for a given period of time, which may be longer or shorter, we don't even know for sure. Um, but you are still and always um, just a part of this larger order and, and this, this independence that, that you have and this capacity for choice and for moral agency is, is really something that, and Seneca, for example, is strong on this as well. It's kind of like you've got it on loan from the larger order of nature. Um, so I, I think my position is broadly Massimo's, which is that I think if the Stoics were around today, would they say, well, we can't, we can't abide by modern physics? I, 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 I don't think so. I, I think that they would be um, telling us to, to try to inform ourselves about you know, the, best, the best physical understandings of the world in which we find ourselves. Um, but yeah, this idea of providence, for example, that, that is, is really quite powerful and strong in ancient Stoicism um, is, is something that isn't there in modern physics. And, and it does create questions that people are debating. Um, so in terms of what to study, um, I really do think it's important to, and I think it does enhance your sense of Stoicism to try to, to try to get a sense of the system through say a book like John Sellers's book, which looks at the physics and the logic and the ethics. I mean, the connections between the logic and the physics and the ethics are, are, are somewhat indirect, but I think I've certainly felt that to, to have a sense of the larger picture, it, it does kind of lock it all in um, because you sort of see how the ethical positions are supported by the logical positions that are supported by the physical positions. Um, and it does provide a sense of cohesion about it, which gives you that, uh, it gives you a little bit more solidity. Um, I, I think you can be a modern Stoic without necessarily doing those things, but I, I, I would recommend, say, the book by Sandbach, which I think is just called The Stoics, was written in the 70s, um, which is the book that I kind of encountered the system um, in, and John Sellers's book, which is like from 2007, which I think is, it's not his book on the art of living, but it's the book on Stoicism per se. Um, so I would encourage people to, to look at the, the logic and the physics uh, in terms of getting this, this larger sense um, of the Stoic view of, of the whole. And I do think it does have flow on effects in terms of the lived experience of trying to kind of be more Stoic. That was a very long response, sorry. <laughs> 
Any follow-up, Laura? Uh, no, but just thank you so much for coming. Thank you. So just a quick follow-up, um, you know, Brad Inwood. I think he makes a distinction between large stoicism and minimal stoicism. Large stoicism has that tripartite, the physics, logic, and uh, ethics, while the minimal stoics just say you just need the ex ethics and maybe like a minimum viable physics or whatever that might like uh, flow from that. And I know a lot of modern stoics, it's, it's, a, it's a big tent, but a lot of modern stoics have uh, that kind of minimal um, stoic proclivities. So wh where would you fall in that divider or what do you think is uh, best there? I think the ancients were large Stoics. Um, I don't think I'm quite a minimal Stoic for the reasons that I've described. I think I'm sort of uh, somewhere in between. Um, I mean, I, I, I came to Stoicism, you know, uh, uh, in some ways through the practice and in some ways th through Pierre Hadot. And, and he talks about practical physics as well and, and practical logic, which is, which is this practice of just monitoring you know, judgment. The, the example I always use in my class about Stoic practical logic is, you know, one of the things that I've been guilty of saying many times over the years, because I do this all the time, is <laughs> there you go. I say to my wife when I lose my keys for the next time, I always do this. And that's actually not true because it's probably only about somewhere between 10 and 30% of the days of the week that I lose my keys, which is still awfully high. Um, but I'll say, I'll say things that are untrue in, in, in the passion of frustration um, that I always lose my keys. And, and, and Stoic logic in a practice sense in part is sort of saying, well, that's actually not true. You know, sometimes you do, probably too often, probably you should put some more practices in place. But there's something about passion and the passe that puts you in, in the space of these absolute judgments. I always, I never, you never say this, you never do this. And very often, I mean, I'm reminded of Don Robertson's description of anger as temporary stupidity. It's like, actually, the environment's more complex than that. And what passions do is, is put you in this kind of black and white mindset. And I think stoic logic at the practice level is assessing the judgments that you're forming and giving assent to. And, and you know, trying in that moment to just be a little bit more self-critical and sort of say, you're saying something that's untrue again. Um, and hopefully by just doing that over and over again in the heat of the moment, the impulse to leap to the nevers and the always is, is going to be a little bit reduced. Uh, do, do you have a hard stop at the top of the hour or could you maybe 10, 15 minutes after? Um... Yeah, sure. I think so. Yeah. Um, I don't have a class, so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe 10 minutes after, because we just had some really great questions. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll just check in my diary. I don't think I've got a nine o'clock, but yeah, so let's just keep going. And if, if I get a phone call, then. Cool, cool. Yeah. Um, Evan, uh, we're not going to go in particular order with the questions either. We're not going to get to everyone, but I'll, I'll take in Evan next. All right, thanks. So this is kind of a weird question. I hope it makes sense. So um, I'm thinking about the topic of the cultivation and discernment of virtue. So it seems to me that there's an essential component to this that's nonverbal practice, um, not necessarily strictly reducible to like rules of logic or you know verbal mental models. And that the fruits of this practice also are not particularly amenable to the presentation in the form of say logical argument that's normally employed in modern philosophy. There's something deeply personal and connected to the psyche or the soul that's going on in this cultivation. So I'm curious um, to hear your thoughts about the tensions that this creates with our more popular ethical frameworks of the day, like deontology, consequentialism, and their variations, which uh, to me seem to have this sort of like virtue-shaped hole in the middle of them and, uh, and be less willing to admit of the existence of these sort of things that can't be maybe written down in a philosophically, you know, um, formalized way. Um, so any thoughts you have on that? I'm curious. Yeah. Um... So, I mean, as, as I kind of um, skirted, obviously the Stoics view, um, I mean, they have a monistic view of the universe, that is everything is physical. Um, and they have a, therefore a monistic view of the soul. It's not like there's a kind of immortal or invisible or um, intangible soul that's somehow kind of implanted in a physical body. And so uh, it's really interesting when you look at their, their understandings of knowledge and the virtues, they have two levels. They have like a kind of a logical or discursive level where, it's a system of beliefs that you're cultivating, but on the other hand, it's a tenor of the psyche, which is is a, is is an intentionally physical kind of 
idea that, you know, everything in the universe is held together um, and it has a certain tonos. And by kind of shaping yourself by forming new beliefs, you're, you're kind of reshaping the, the tonos of your own, your own soul. So it's a physical thing as well. And I mean, the fact that, that there are these exercises that um, the Stoics ask us to undertake, which engage the imagination, and some of them are, you know, are like are kind of like fasting exercises that Seneca describes for quite, you know, quite simply physical. And Musonius Rufus talks about, you know, there are exercises that are kind of what we might say are mental. There are some that are mental and physical, and there's some that are just physical, and they're all important. Um, you know, this kind of holistic perspective is, for me, a recommendation of, of Stoicism. Um, and you're right that, you know, Kantianism or, or, or utilitarianism just tells you their views of what makes an action right or good. It tells you nothing about how you how you get to a situation where you can regularly accomplish right or good actions. It just sort of, you know, gives you the, the utility, the, the philosophic calculus in utilitarianism or the categorical imperative in Kant. Um, and particularly in Kant, this is an issue because you've got to form your motivations in order to, to act correctly. And it's like, well, how do you do that? And, and Kantian philosophy doesn't really give you any equipment. Um, and, and I think Stoicism does. And, and as I say, I think this is one reason why it's, um, it's becoming so attractive to people outside of just the academy, because I think it's a pretty, it's not really an insight of, of sort of esoteric value that, that an ethical life has a physical component. <laughs> um, and um, a social component, it's not just all in our heads. Um, uh, for me, this idea of reshaping the soul, so the way you respond to impressions, changes, um, necessarily is going to involve physiological transformation um, through practices. And you're right, I, I, just, I just think that there's no space for that in academic, academic um, deontology or, or the other major frameworks. Yeah. There's a quick follow-up to that. Um, yeah. I guess in my own personal life and, and sort of practice, I kind of find my two biggest influences to be stoicism and then more Eastern inflected, um, you know, specifically Buddhist practices, right? So I, I'm curious about your thoughts on this because I see that I'm probably not the only one that has this sort of mishmash where, okay, stoic philosophy is quite important, but also as far as actually operationalizing that, like say looking at Eastern meditative practices too, uh, improve metacognitive introspective awareness in real time, that kind of thing. So do you think that's a fruitful hybrid or is it somehow bastardizing stoicism? I, I mean, I, I, my own um, experience that I briefly mentioned um, was that that year where I was, where I was doing the, the Vipassana and then adding to that um, um, stoic um, reflections, uh, I found that a, a very powerful combination. I think it was the happiest year of my life. I also got married that year. So, I mean, that's obviously an external factor. <laughs> and life is so simple then without children as well. Um, but um, I just found that the way I describe it to, 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 to again, to people who are interested in this question is I found that, that those practices with pastor and so on, and this idea of, of you know this idea you have first impressions and then you have the ascent for stoicism so i had the impulse to get really angry and then 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 there's what you do with that i found that the gap between the first impulse and the ascent got wider with the buddhist practice again i mean you look at someone like Lionel messi who he just seems to have more time than other other footballers i don't know i'm a huge messi fan and it it's as though he's broken the code he can just do things that other people can't do. And it, for me, it felt like with that, that Eastern practice, the, the gap between that impulse and now I'm angry already, just got wider. There's an impulse and now maybe I'm not going to get angry. And just the options just, just, just expand a little bit. And that for me was very much to do with the bodily side of the, the practice. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Evan. Um, we'll, we'll take an Andrew and this will probably be the last question, uh, Andrew. You're up. Thank you. Um, so I had a question about um, essentially 
sort of the ambiguity around virtue ethics uh, that I found. Um, so living in the modern world is, is often complex and you know there's a lot of messy moral issues which one could potentially argue something like utilitarianism gives more uh, advice for direct action such as you know dealing with global supply chains and a bunch of trolley problems per se. So how does a stoic navigate these complexities and make virtuous decisions? And on a broader level, how does one even know if they acted virtuously in any given situation? Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for that, Andrew. Yeah, um, look, the Stoics, and this is the, the, the virtue ethics position, um, they don't really provide, and this, yeah, they don't really provide a kind of like a, a kind of all-purpose decision procedure, as you're probably aware, to sort of, you know, that you can take into every situation and kind of, you know, run the, the different possibilities through that procedure and come up with a solution. The closest that you'll get is um, some stuff in some of Cicero in, um, I think it's in Deificius, where he does talk about something quite like a global supply chain issue. He talks about what happens if a Stoic is in a situation where they're like, a, they're a merchant and somewhere down the chain, they, they've got advanced information that there's going to be some kind of a shortage or glut in the market. Um, do they have a duty to provide information to other members of their community in terms of um, how they then um, uh, proceed and, and maybe raise or, or lower their prices? And there is, there is in that text, there, is, there are two schools from memory that are, that some Stoics say, well, you should, you have a duty, you're a social animal, you have a duty to inform people in the community who might buy these products that this is what's going on. And then there are other Stoics who take the more, I guess, economistic stance that, no, you have no duty to, to do that. Um, um, you should just proceed um, uh, without feeling any obligation. Um, and that's as close as I've found in, in, in reading this material. And again, I, I welcome others to, to come in on this. Um, the emphasis is... is 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 on the on the attitudes you form towards the the actions that you you take and 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 thereby on the virtues that you're exhibiting in, in the actions that you're you're undertaking and does this mean that perhaps stoicism could become coordinate with a practice where you might um, adopt utilitarianism in certain situations I, I, I that's certainly how I read it um, yeah. So I, I do think that it's a different kind of ethical philosophy. Its emphasis is different. Um, and it, it doesn't provide the same kinds of solutions that you're going to get, particularly from utilitarianism, which I think is the strongest in terms of looking at those kind of macro issues that, that we face um, and asks us to make decisions about different courses of action affecting large numbers of other people. Yeah. Any questions? Uh follow up Andrew uh, no th thanks for the answer thanks. all right so uh, we'll close here um, I always love uh, again talking about stoicism I can do it all day uh, but um, yeah any closing thoughts you have for us Matthew anything you'd like to leave us with or anything you're doing stoic related that could be interesting um I don't know. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, I, again, thank you for having me. Thank you for everybody for, for, for listening. I mean, I, I'm like you. I could, I think I could sit here and, and, and discuss these things for, for ages. And I always sort of come out of stoic events feeling really a, a sort of elevated. And, 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 um, and um, I take that energy with me for, for, for a little while. I mean, the, the time when we, when we met in Athens, I don't know about you, but I got back to, to Melbourne and uh, for about two weeks, I, I just felt like I was on a really real high. Just I think, and that's to do with the connectedness of, of kind of being able to talk openly about these these subjects with people who are passionate, and and also this this business about I, I think about about the kind of non cognitive dimension of stoicism. I, as as the question was being asked earlier, I was thinking that there's there's a line in one of Seneca's letters where he says that half of you know becoming a becoming a better stoic is is really the volitional it's it's, it's making the commitment and holding yourself to that commitment and it's it's more difficult i think to do that alone and you know obviously religious traditions have had that insight for thousands of years 
that if you can bring people together and provide formats for them to to share their experiences and assist each other and um, hold each other accountable to to what we we each think are important I, I think it's it's tremendously powerful um, so I guess just thank you for the, for the opportunity to to share a little bit of the more theoretical side of things but also just to be in a space where I don't have to conceal my stoicism and my sympathies with stoicism but we can all just say hey we're really interested in this we might have various questions about it there might be limits to it but you know what there's a heck of a lot here that's really powerful and important so yeah thanks again yeah my pleasure um and i'll make some closing announcements in a moment uh but matthew thank you so much for coming to the stoa I'd love to have you back uh we're sort of like uh we have the name of weird stoics here at the stoa because we're like really experimenting with all these different traditions and mixing things together. Um, in case of point, we're, we're having um, something called stoic circling. There's this intersubjective practice uh, uh, of called circling and we're combining stoicism with it. Um, so that's gonna be launched soon. It's gonna be a three part series. And another event that just got uh, posted today, I'm super excited, uh, the Dunbar's number, Robin Dunbar, the guy who came up with the Dunbar's number, he's coming in to the stoa. That's gonna be a Patreon event. And we have this super huge event that's going to be announced soon, but I don't, I don't, I don't want to announce it yet. So stay tuned for that. Uh, so that being said, Matthew, everyone, yeah. thank you. Just make, oh, sorry, just make sure I'm a practical, make sure I'm on the email. Please. I, I don't think I've been on the email list previously. So absolutely. I'd love to, particularly if it's at this time, I don't know whether this is your usual time, but yeah, we have, uh, this, is, this is possible in Australia. And so many events are like two in the morning over here, which makes it tough. But yeah. Beautiful. Like we, we have like like maybe three or five actual Stoics at the Stoics. So it'll be good to have another one that's at least 80%. So uh, yes. I'll definitely email you that. Uh, yep. Matthew, everyone, thank you so much for coming to Stoic today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.